Hello human geographers. Tonight, we're going to examine rural settlement patterns and a model on how rural land is used. So let's start with our rural settlements. A rural settlement is a sparsely settled place away from the influence of large cities. So let's look at the details. A rural area is an area that's located outside of an urban area, such as a town or city. Rural areas tend to be associated with the primary sector, so farming, mining, forestry, things like that. And about one-third of the Earth's surface is devoted to these types of activities. Rural areas tend to have relatively fewer buildings and homes and lower population density. But the density of human settlement often relates to the intensity of the land use. The more intensive the land use, like subsistence rice farming, the higher the population density tends to be. And agricultural areas can have very distinctive landscape features. Rice paddies, barns, grain elevators, which are used for storing surplus grain, and feedlots are all tend to be found in rural areas. And the green circles that are associated with center pivot irrigation are another very recognizable feature of the agricultural landscape. And property and field borders are often marked by fences or hedges, heightening the visibility of these lines in the agricultural landscape. And the types of fences can vary by region and group. For example, in rural New England, Western Ireland, or the Yucatan Peninsula, you might see miles of stone fences. Barbed wire fences stretch across much of the American interior. In Appalachia, the traditional split rail fence is especially common. And in parts of France and Great Britain, the hedge, a sort of living fence, is especially prominent. Since rural areas tend to be fairly low density, we can examine how people organize themselves on the land. Rural settlement patterns tend to be classified as either clustered or dispersed. Clustered settlements are also known as villages or hamlets. In these settlements, homes are located near each other with the fields, pastures, and meadows beyond the limits of the village. This makes it convenient for sharing services like schools or religious institutions like churches. Clustered farm villages are the most common form of agricultural settlement in much of Europe, in many parts of Latin America, in the densely settled farming regions of Asia, including many areas in India, China, and Japan, and in the parts of Africa and the Middle East that are home to sedentary farming people. In the United States, the New England farm village was a transplant of the English farm village. In the agricultural villages found in the American Southwest were transplanted from Spain. Mormon farm villages in Utah provide an excellent example of the clustering force of religion. But generally, North American farmers created dispersed settlements, a pattern in which farmers lived in homes spread out throughout the countryside. This was brought on in part because rural areas were claimed by individual pioneer families rather than by socially cohesive groups. It does offer greater peace and security while also ensuring there are fewer disputes over resources such as water. Land survey patterns or land division patterns can impact the types of settlements that we see in different areas. Survey patterns occur as land surveyors lay out property lines. And this can be done before, during, or after an area is settled and requires geometry as well as specialized tools. And there are three major types of land survey systems that are especially impactful for rural areas throughout the United States. We also see similar patterns in other places around the world. 
So let's look at each of those three in turn. In parts of the East Coast of the United States, we see the meets and bounds system. This surveying system uses natural features such as trees, boulders, and streams to lay out property lines. Meets were used for short distances, like from the oak tree 100 yards north to the corner of the barn. Bounds cover larger areas and were based on larger features such as streams or roads. As a result, meets and bounds produce parcels of land that are irregularly shaped, as you can see in the photo. As you move into the interior of the United States, we see a system that is known as township and range. Thomas Jefferson wanted a national pattern of equitable land ownership for small-scale independent farmers. So the U.S. Land Ordinance of 1785 imposed a dispersed system on the country outside of the 13 original colonies and a few other states or portions of states. The Homestead Act, which came later, provided individual families parcels of land as long as they worked to develop it. The township and range system did not use natural landscape features, but instead organized land into townships, areas that were six miles long by six miles wide, and a one square mile section, which could be sold in whole, half, or quarter sections. As a result, the landscape has rectangular, or as you'll sometimes see it, rectilinear plots of consistent size, creating a very uniform land use system. Finally, the long lot system is found in parts of North America that were colonized by the French, such as Quebec and Louisiana. The basic unit is a rectangle, typically 10 times larger than it is wide. Farms were long, thin sections of land that ran perpendicular to a road, river, or canal, so that every farmer had land, water, and access to some transportation system. We also see this system used in parts of Texas and northern New Mexico, and it is also widely used in the hills and marshes of Central and Western Europe, as well as in parts of Brazil and Argentina. Shifting gears, let's look at a famous model regarding agricultural land and how it's used. This is called a von Thunen model which is a model that explains location of agricultural activities in a commercial profit-making economy. A process of spatial competition allocates various farming activities into rings around a central market city with profit-earning capability as the determining force in how far a crop locates the market. This model is named after its creator, Johann Heinrich von Thunen. So let's take a look at the details. Von Thunen developed this model in 1826 when he noticed that as he moved farther away from the city, one commodity or crop gave way to another without any real visible change in soil, climate, or terrain. So let's look at the model he developed. In the first ring is horticulture or market gardening as well as dairying. These were highly perishable crops, such as tomatoes, strawberries, and milk. These activities were intensive, high levels of output per parcel of land. Vegetables and milk commanded higher prices because of their perishability, as well as the fact that they were more difficult to transport to market. In the second ring was lumber, which was used as a fuel and building material making it an extremely important resource in 1826. While perishability wasn't really a concern, lumber is heavy and bulky, thereby significantly increasing its transportation costs, which then required it to be closer to the market. In the third ring, crops such as wheat, corn, and other grain crops are grown. These crops are more extensive, thus providing lower revenue per parcel of land. In addition, they're also less bulky and easier to transport without risk 
of perishing in ruin. Finally, the fourth one is where the livestock are found. This land was used for grazing by cows, sheep, goats, and other livestock. The livestock could walk to market, and the only real transportation cost would be paying the herdsmen to help to keep the cost down. And while meat is perishable, and this was a significant concern in 1826, spoilage could be avoided if the animals were walked to market and then slaughtered there. So the grazing land was far away, while the slaughterhouses were closer to the urban market. And it's important to note that the extensive nature of grains and livestock meant that those farms produced less revenue per parcel of land and as a result, were larger than those located in the inner rings of the model. So how did Von Thunen come up with this model, and why does it operate this way? Well, he knew that farmers wanted to maximize their profit, and with only a single market, there must be a reason to explain why farmers would grow a certain crop in a certain position relative to that market. Essentially, this model examines the influence of distance from market and the influence of transportation costs on the type and intensity of agriculture. So let's start with transportation costs. Von Thunen argued that these costs were proportional to the distance from market. Essentially, with greater distance from the market, transportation costs were higher. And those transportation costs would then govern how the land was used. It's important to note at this point that distance decay is a major component of this model. As distance increased from market, several notable elements declined. The intensity of the land use declines. The perishability of the crops declines. And the value of the land declines. So now we need to explain why the value of the land declines and how that impacts the crop choices, since that was what Von Thunen noticed in the first place. So let me introduce you to the bid-rent curve. A bid-rent curve can be used to indicate the starting position for each land use relative to the market, as well as where each land use would end. According to bid-rent theory, the land closest to the market was most valuable because it was more accessible to people. So farmers who use that land must do so intensively so they could turn a profit from a relatively small amount of land. To read the graph, the y-axis represents profit. The x-axis represents distance from market. So notice that each of the colored lines declines in profit with increasing distance from market. So when does a farmer switch to a different crop? when they can make more profit from doing so. So when the uppermost line on the graph intersects with the next uppermost line, that indicates where it is more profitable to switch crops, and thus we see a change in zones. So for example, at this point, lumber has declined in profitability because it is too far from the city and transportation costs have risen too high that it actually becomes more profitable to switch to the more extensive, less perishable grain crops, which have lower transportation costs. And because this land is farther from market, making it less accessible, this land is also less valuable and therefore cheaper. So a farmer can buy more land to grow more extensive grain crops and turn their profit. Von Thunen's model was the first economic location model and provided the basis for later models on the secondary and tertiary sector. But like all models, it needs to be adapted to actual conditions as well as changes in technology. And the real world is far more complicated. So let's start by assuming that land isn't completely flat or featureless and imagine that a river flows through the plain. That would make transportation easier and cheaper along the river, and then the zones would stretch out along the river. As countries industrialized, there were improvements in technology. Due to improvements in refrigeration and transportation systems, 
Intensive crops like strawberries and milk can be produced farther from the market than in von Thunen's time. A good example is space-time compression. But relative locations remain the same. They are still produced closer to the market than our grains and livestock, more extensive activities. So let's try to bring this a little closer to reality. Our map of the United States shows similar range to our von Thunen model. Forestry is the outlier with the far western part of the country as the source of forest products. Wood has largely been replaced by oil, natural gas, and electricity as a fuel source for heating homes. So forests are rarely located near communities today. Now forested land that is near a city might actually be highly valuable as a green space, such as a park. Our second U.S. map factors in another element that we know impacts agriculture, climate. We know that climate type and soil quality weigh heavily on the kinds of goods that are produced. Areas with better climates or more fertile soil have a comparative advantage or a naturally occurring beneficial condition for certain crops. There is not a lot of change in the zones designated for market gardening, but notice that dairying has shifted north and west, and corn and soybeans extend eastward to the coast. A much larger area of the United States is shown for livestock ranching. There is also the addition of specialty crops like oranges in Florida and Mediterranean agriculture in California which are heavily tied to the climate of those regions. Another example that a lot of geographers use when talking about von Thunen's model is Uruguay. Uruguay is a largely flat plained area dominated by a single city, Montevideo, similar to Mont von Thunen's original premise. Montevideo, the capital city, is also a port. Notice that the prediction, based on von Thunen's model, is very similar to the reality of agriculture in Uruguay. One noticeable difference is that the grain farming extends much farther north due to the Uruguay River. But even after we look at these applications and examples, there are a few notes I want to leave you with. No model accounts for every variation that occurs in practice. For example, the United States has more than just New York City as a market, which is also the case for most countries. But this model is useful for studying the regional distribution of types of commercial agriculture. Von Thunen's underlying concern about the relationship between land use and transportation costs still explains many agricultural patterns today. And while improvements in transportation technology have reduced the applicability of the model, the focus on maximizing profits for commercial farmers is just as relevant today as it was in 1826. That's all for tonight, everybody. I'll see you back in.